Good morning, everyone. I'm Jimmy Gann. I, uh, I work at a local financial firm, and Eric, I've known Eric for years, and I've been in the Betterman Village a couple years, and he asked if I could do a quick talk about emotions. And some of you may or may not know what happened this week, but uh, the markets actually did me a favor and not a favor. So it did me a favor because there is some emotions that come with it. It also did not do me a favor because uh, my, my personal portfolio and my client's portfolios are down. So it happens. The question came up and some research I was doing is, should we use emotions in making decisions? The answer is yes, but you really should use it as a opportunity to set some guide rails or excuse some guard rails and also set some expectations amongst yourself but you shouldn't thrive purely on emotional decision. So I'm going to dump, jump into it. It's only going to be about 10, maybe, maybe 8 minutes of conversation from me up here, but then I'll open it up to questions and answers. The one favor I do ask is, uh, please don't ask any questions specifically about the market. Uh, I'm here as more of an educational tool, um, and for my compliance department, I'm here as more of a, having a friendly conversation and not directing you any uh, investments or any uh, opportunities you may or may not take. Fair enough, everyone? Yes. All right. So the emotions of investing. So as you can see here, the blue, we talk about optimism, excitement, thrill, euphoria. So that euphoria is where you have the maximum risk. That's where everything's going great. You think that's, that's, that's where we're going to be, right? That's, this is never going to come down. This is going to be forever. That's where you have maximum risk. As the market starts to pull back, start to see some economic data that's starting to make you wonder what's going on you first tell yourself nah it's fine we'll get through it we'll, we'll pull through you go through that denial then you have a little little anxiety you have a little bit of that what I like to call speaker's stomach little butterflies in there a little bit of that internal like oh what's going on then you get some downright fear like oof should I have called my person or should I have gone on to my account should I have gone on my retirement account should I have gone to cash, they've gone to bonds, um, then the data comes out and the market starts to just come straight down. We're really starting to look at it, starting to get worried, you're starting to panic, you're all the way down to deposits. That is your opportunity point. <clears throat> so I'm going to pause there for a minute. Has anyone ever heard of buy low, sell high? Raise your hands, right? Have you ever heard of buy low, sell Y? No? Okay. And then the third one I always ask is, have you ever heard of buy high, sell low? What of those three do most people do? First one, second one, or third one? Third one. Third one. Absolutely, right? Because your friends, your neighbors, your buddies, like, hey, I bought Amazon at 800. Well, now it's worth 2,600. You're like, wow, Amazon. Like, I got to get it today. So that's when you buy high, and then all of a sudden it comes down, and you start selling it, right? So... That maximum opportunity right there is where you really want to get into a market. I'm not suggesting nor applying that right now is the trough or the trough or the lowest point in the market, but this is in that point where we're at right now. And then you start to come through, you're a little skeptic, is the market going to come back? And then you hop into some hope, get a little bit of relief. And then guess what? You wash, rinse, and repeat, you start right back over here at Optimism. What I want to do is I wanted to give you guys a little bit um, of just a little education on what I've seen. So if you see the market cycle one, that's 71 through 75. The second one's 84 through 89. This period right here up until 84 is called stagflation. That's where the government did a lot of things, the government did a lot of things, and inflation went up, the market just stayed. For those folks that were around, it was not a fun time. Not fun at all. Then we have the 97 through 05, and then as everyone remembers, the old uh, financial crisis of 05 through 14. Now we have market five, which I like to call, um, has anyone heard of a bi uh, relevance bias, right? You only remember what happened most recently. So we're gonna talk about that from 2015 to 2021. So that first part, investors have been optimistic, excited, thrown euphoric in, this mark, in the first part of that market, 2015. So I'm gonna give you guys an optimism, a little definition. Investors typically start with optimism, which sits at the inflection point of the emotional upswing. We commonly expect this to go our way, and we expect to have a return of the risk we're investing because we believe that the markets will continue to grow 
wealth through what we're choosing. All right, market cycle five, January 15th through February 2020. Does anyone know what the most important two points of those dates are? Month before COVID, right, before the pandemic. And then that was on the tail end of the, what we call the financial crisis. Your returns, if you had your money in there, 79%. We had full employment in the U.S. Optimism was just going. We had the 2016 uh, tax cuts, and then trade war really escalated between us and some of our foreign diggers, and then Fed rate continues to cut. So when the Fed cuts it, people borrow money cheaply, money is in motion, businesses borrow to buy, build capital, etc., build um, inventory up. And then we have this little uh, virus that's going to China that's identified, we're like, oh, you know, and I, I don't know if you guys have, your, everyone has their own story, but I had a trip planned in March to go to Nashville and uh, it was the spring break week, our kids, we all got together and we got an email, make sure your kids take everything home. And every teacher is like, take it all out, take it everything out of your lockers. And we're like, and then we get the email and as everyone goes, everything starts to get shut down, those kind of things. And so, um, then we start entering in this denial, anxious, fearful past, right? We start to wonder about it. I'm not gonna get through this, you understand what fear means, but really what, what it does is it makes you make a flight to safety. You want to go to bonds, you want to go to cash, those kind of deals. So market cycle, late February 2020, market goes down 13%, COVID starts to hit, stock markets fall in late February, and then shutdowns are communicated, things are starting to get a little, you're starting to get a little worried, right? So you having that little bit of fear, a little bit of worry, you're starting to wonder what's going to happen. Then you start getting to this point where investors start getting depressed, panic. They're starting to really worry, like, what, what are we doing here? What, what's going to happen? And then, oh, uh, apologize, John. And then here it is, March 2020. It is officially classified as global pandemic. Now we're down 23%. Travel and commerce, I, I'm not even sure if there's maybe a handful of jets going around just to take what they call necessary or the, those folks that had to work. And then we're pretty much in a quarantine for two weeks here in the United States. Some of the world was in a quarantine for months, right? We, we really got to that point. That's that market cycle. And panic happened. People were making decisions in their portfolios. When I had my clients, I had, a, excuse me, I have a roughly 254 clients that I deal with. Um, out of all those, two sold out. Most of them I was able to kind of talk out, you know, hey, relax, we've been through this before. Um, one had to buy a property, so I, I, I completely understand what she did, what she did. The other one sold out, and to this day, he's still sitting in cash. To this day. Now, he might have been a genius, but maybe he puts that in there now, but no one saw this coming, so. Um, all right. Then we start getting that skeptical, hopeful, a little bit of relief. We're going, is the market gonna come back? Well, CARES Act was signed. We all know about the PPP loans. We all know about the things the government did. And the market came from March 2020 to December 21. So literally a little over a year and a half, it went up 116%. So if you went cash and never got back in, you missed out on quite a bit probably about 116% relative to what you would own. Um, what, I, what I really kind of talk about, it, then we hit that euphoria, right? Now, now we're, we're there, we're all in, and you know, this is, this is back to where we make financial risk an issue again. Because now we're thinking, well, you know, I have all this money I didn't spend during COVID. Market's pretty high, do I jump all in? <coughs> Maybe not. The question is, your time horizon, what kind of emotions can you deal with? And the last thing I always tell folks is, why are you making an investment? Is it based on the emotions and the items, the conversation you have with people, or are you making a strategic decision to invest? I'll end on this, and then this is what um, typically I, I get a lot of. Well, Jimmy, when's the best time to invest? I say, well, a couple things. One, when you have the money, you've got to have money to invest. Two would be, are you able to understand what your strategic 
gold is with it. If you're doing it for a short term, there are short term investments to get into. Absolutely. But what it really ties back into is the third thing. Can you stomach whatever decision you make and be able to make changes to your goal? The last part of our presentation that was on there that Eric and I talked about was, do you need a financial advisor, a financial planner, all, all those things? Well, I'm gonna be a little vulnerable and really honest with y'all real quick. So, I've done this for over 10 years. I ran Target Sword before, so I'm, I'm well versed in the business world. And uh, I bought a stock about four years ago. Um, it was a, it was kind of a, a thought I had to go out and research it and found it. I bought it at nine dollars a share. And I bought quite a bit of it. It went to 49.50, and then I thought to myself, fifty dollars. I'm going to sell it at fifty dollars, right? Well. The next day, it got to 50 and a half, 50.55, for about three hours. And I sat there. I'll make a phone call. I got to do some other stuff. I sat there. Well, it's still at 50.52. And I didn't pull the trigger. Anyone want to guess what that stock trades at right now? Take a shot in the dark. Anybody? $2. $3.10 as of two days ago. I think it is around $2 now. So. I needed my own advisor, and funny to tell you, that taught me enough to know that I have to partner with one of my partners in my firm to say, hey, when I make a decision, a finite decision, sell it at 50, help me execute that. Help me put that in the system, put it in there for me, and I can take my emotions and my thoughts out of it. Do you need a financial advisor? Everyone needs a financial advisor. When do you really need one? When you have implications of, do I know what a Roth is? Do I know what a traditional IRA is? Do I know what I'm doing at work? All those questions. Secondly, if you own a business, are part of a business, there's folks I've met here that are really creates really nice entities. If you don't have a CPA or a tax um, accountant, you really need one, and then you need to join them with the financial advisor. That's the aspect and the point that you need to make good decisions on the legal end. And then lastly, I would say everyone most folks I know in the business will always do a 35, 45 minute consult, and we're really upfront with you. Sometimes I've told people that weren't my clients yet, hey, go find one online, put it in there, start that out. Make sure you can be a consistent investor, and when you get there, let's create a financial plan for you. So that's really what I talk about when does everyone need a plan or need an advisor? I think so, because as I said earlier, emotions is the part I deal with. I'm not a therapist, nor am I a licensed therapist, but I spend half my time in therapy with my clients. So, as I said, I'm Jimmy Gann. I'll open it up the floor um, to questions and answers. And like I said, please don't be specific to anything, you know, related to your account or anything I have to make a recommendation on. So, questions? Nothing? Yeah, I know you have a question, Matt. Go ahead. Um, so, in the information security community, there's a lot of healthy skepticism about don't take things at face value and that kind of stuff. So, from a due diligence standpoint, picking a financial advisor can feel like a very scary endeavor. So, are there things like FINRA or other kind of due diligence type things that you think are reasonable for people to follow in saying, yeah, this is a person that I'm willing to kind of make myself vulnerable with to kind of reach out to. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. So yeah, so FINRA, which is our, one of our governing bodies, um, it's one of the financial regulatories. There's a, a little item on there. If you go to any website for an advisor, it's, we have to legally have this on there. It's called Broker Check. You click it, it should take it. You can put in my last name. It'll tell you my licensing, tell me what states I'm licensing at that moment, tell you the firms I work for. And it will also have what we call disclosures, right? So if, if a client had a, uh, or even a non-client had a, what we call a question or what, uh, I'm trying to think of the actual word of it, but we disclose anything that a complaint, even if it's unfounded, we would disclose that. So my client, Mary, calls me, says things, and she has a complaint, we will have it on there and investigate it and document it. Now, read through them. Don't just see them, because some of them, believe it or not, I've gotten a few chuckles off of. And so, 
Someone I know had a, they're 18 years old, they're on a bike, they are young cops. You have to put that on there. Literally, it has a whole documentation about how they are around the cops for like 30 miles and eventually pulled over and got arrested. And <laughs> it's on there, but it's, it's, it's disclosed because anything like that has to be on there. Bankruptcies have to be on there. Anything has to do legally. The last thing I say is don't just do that. Have a conversation with them. I literally rub 20% of the population the wrong way. I'm boisterous. I'm outgoing. I have my hands up. I talk. I drive my neighbors crazy. It's a lot of funny things. And so uh, just talk to them. Have a conversation. If they're not your person, that's okay. They'll probably have someone that's a lot opposite of them or mostly opposite of them, and they can connect you. Uh, the last thing is I'll say, follow that little thing right here, right? The gut. You walk in and it just doesn't feel right, follow the gut, and that's okay. I, I have no problems having someone walk out of my office because their gut just told them it wasn't. Thank you for that question. There's, a, there's quite a few financial things that you're saying. Some of our are quite a bit more mainstream out there as well. So somebody like Dave Ramsey, are they uh, things that you want to keep an eye out for in a good way, or how do you, how would you separate the two versus? Um, so I'm a little biased on that, so I, and I'll explain why. So I, I worked for Lighthouse Financial Strategies, and for over 15 years we were an ELP. So if anyone doesn't know that, that's a local endorsed local endorsed local provider. And so Dave talks about that. There's a lot of things going on with that. I think that's a good place to start, um, but I wouldn't necessarily put all my eggs in that and say that person's great because of that. I think what we talked about earlier is part of it. Um, and also, take, take for granted, just because someone recommends them, you don't always know what goes on in the back end. How that recommendation came about, or even if it's endorsed, or however you want to call it, where that came from. Um, but if your advisor or future advisor is talking to you, they just can't be straight with you, that kind of answers it. And, and there should be a conversation about anything. I, I'll answer 95% of anything. A few things personally, I just for person. You talked about the company and how you researched it before you invested into it. Do you have any kind of tips on how to go about researching and picking different companies? Yeah, um, so I, I, I would call myself a little bit of a stock jockey on stocks. Mutual funds, I have a portfolio manager that works in our office that handles all my mutual fund trades. I, I just, there's 8,000 mutual funds, or actually more than that, but there's 8,000 that we could use on our platform. I, that's too much. So, that, but individual stocks, yeah. So, uh, cash balance sheets, fundamentals, um, truly understanding what the executive teams do. And that's by no means a recommendation, that's just some ideas they're going to look at. Um, all their things are on K1, so they put them all online on the SEC, they have to file every quarter. And you can actually see what the executive office is doing, if they're buying and selling. Um, the last thing I would probably tell you is, this is really simple, and, but look around and while you spend your money, or your friends and family and people around you spend your money. Right? So if they're spending their money there, I always say this, Walmart's parking lot never seems to be empty. Is that a good stock, bad stock? I don't know, we can dig into it more, but it's a good place to start all the things around. I just see Apple, I see, you know, I can look around and see all Samsung. I can see all these different things out here that we use every day. That's one of my things too. I have to be able to, to understand what they produce or what they service they provide. Anything else? What's your thoughts on index funds? Hmm. Uh, so I'm going to give you a very, uh, very simple thing. Everyone loves them when they're going up because I can't beat the index because it's the index, right? And some of my accounts have fees in them, some of my accounts have commissions in them, so it's very difficult to beat that. Um, everyone hates them when it goes down because you ride the index down. So what we call up capture, down capture, when your portfolio has a 90% up capture, you're getting 90% of that index. Down capture, you want to try to do that the other way and only capture, you know, 50 of it because then you, that's where you make your cream, your crop, right? But one thing I will tell you is the index has changed to the size of the companies. Sometimes the company's in there for the wrong reason. They've gotten so many stocks purchased, they've gotten so much volume that they are in that S&P 500 for the wrong reason and you don't want to be part of that one company which holds 20% of that NDC. So, 
Passive management's fine. If there's, no, there's nothing wrong with it. I just don't care for it because I'd rather pay people to help me manage mutual funds and, and do that because I, the way I think of it is, I'm not sure if anything in this world is free. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, give me some perspective. And if you're going to do index funds, make sure your advisor doesn't throw up. One and a half percent fee on there because that just doesn't make sense. That, that, that's out there in the world, but I don't get it, and I, I don't speak for anyone sitting across in a different chair. I don't speak for myself. So, so that you don't you may really do a whole bunch of mutual fund area. Do you have somebody else manage it for you? Yeah. Who who would it, like who am I looking for? Just as a broker? Um, you mean for me, my my personally, or well, we we have a portfolio manager in our office, and his job is to manage hundreds of millions of dollars for us, and that, that's his job to sit there and make decisions based on it. Now, not all the money's in there. You know, there's annuities and insurance and individual stocks. He doesn't do stocks because there's there's a lot of companies. I do them because I enjoy them. I have a conversation with him about it, um, but in the end, it typically goes back to. He understands the mutual fund. He jumps on their calls. He talks to their, their portfolio managers. So uh, we make a selected choice in our office to have someone manage and handle that. Yeah. So most people are here today to, to get the Smarter on Information Security Network and so on. And, and you're not here expecting us to be financial principals any more than we'd expect you to be an information security professional. But uh, it seems like part of your, not shtick, but part of your you know, the value in having this conversation is for us to up our financial IQ a little. A little. Yeah. So my question to you is, are there things that we should be, would be in our interest to kind of be uh, spending a little time, maybe over the course of a given week, if there's one or two places for us to start to level up our you know, kind of financial IQ are any suggestions. Yeah. Other I, than your newsletter or something. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I mean, you can talk to me after this, but I, I made a, uh, an honest, told the, the organization I'm not here to pitch me, I'm here to educate. But uh, so I would tell you that the one or two sticky note things you need to do by Tuesday is find out if your company actually does a retirement plan. A. B, do they match? And C, are you even in it? Because sometimes you're automatically enrolled. And you have no idea, and you're like, oh yeah, I get this email from Prudential. I have no idea what that is. But I just move on because I'm busy. So that's one, right? Do that. Two is, uh, this is hard for everyone, look at your last three months of spending and truly understand what you spend and what's coming in. If that number is consistently negative, you got a problem. Just being dead honest with you. And you're using the emotion somewhere in there to avoid it, to one day it's going to give you anxiety and it's going to blow up again. So, um, the, the third thing I would tell you is, if for any reason none of it makes sense, just call someone. Ask a friend if they have one. Ask, you know, just go talk to anyone that you know that has an advisor and have a conversation with what that relationship looks like. Because I will tell you right now, I've had clients come in here and tell, come in to me and tell me the most audacious things that their spouse may not even know about. But they forgot to tell me about an account for two years. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how you're going to tell me you buried a body in your backyard, but then you forgot that you had that Ameritrade account. <laughs> Finances are so personal. You get very, you know, there's emotions dealing with there. There's some embarrassment, some euphoria. There's all these things with it. Just be straight. Find someone to help you out with. Most advisors will have a conversation with you. It's just, it's, it's that simple. So, three things. Very much so. Um, They've probably heard it before. So, why the embarrassment factor is, yeah, it's very personal, but you're not the first person, and you probably yeah. won't be the last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I, the way I look at it is, I get it. I, I don't hold it against anybody, um, but much like any professional doctor or lawyer, if you kind of don't give me all the information best you can, I, we might make some decisions together that, that do more harm than good. And so, my time. Um, yeah. yeah. Just two things. One, learn the hard way and bust early. Time earns money. Number two, insurance. Get it while you're. It may sound stupid, but get the cheapest we get. Uh, get it while you're young because you'll pay less if you're older. If you don't want to have a conversation with the insurance, there's two types: permanent and term. I'm in the Betterman Village all day. Um, you can Google it. 
believe it or not. There are two different types. One, one you definitely need for sure walking in. One you have an option depending on how you feel about investing. And, and if someone has entered some <laughs> instruments and been guided into some instruments early in my career and had to learn as I went, you know, it's 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 just like security. These things are you know, it's part of your lifelong learning. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the plan changes. We can. Do a plan and you're gonna save eight percent every year and you're gonna you know retire with seven million dollars and then you have kids or then you get ill or you switch jobs or something like that and all of a sudden you can't do it it's, it's like every year it's like a doctor's one you just go in there we do look at the plan is it gonna work no what can we do to change it and are you okay with the outcome every year that's what i do with my clients a minimum of once a year we talk so. well thank you all I appreciate it very much thanks for the time